Today I'll be making some trimethylamine. The stench of trimethylamine is often associated with the decomposition of plants and animals, and especially that of fish. It can contribute to the smell of bad breath and to some bacterial infections like bacterial vaginosis. There's a medical disorder known as trimethylaminuria, or more commonly as fish odor syndrome. The people who are affected by this have a hard time breaking down trimethylamine, so it builds up in their system. It's then released in their breath, their sweat, their urine, etc., and it can have a pretty off-putting fish smell. Anyway, in terms of use, it's used to make a lot of different things, including herbicides and dyes. I honestly don't really have a specific use for it, and I just wanted to make it because I like to make stinky things. In terms of chemicals, this is what I used. In the back, I have paraformaldehyde, sodium hydroxide, and muriatic acid, and in the front, I have ammonium chloride. The muriatic acid, also known as hydrochloric acid, was purchased from a local hardware store along with the sodium hydroxide. The ammonium chloride and the paraformaldehyde were purchased online from eBay. The procedure I'm using here was adapted from the site OrgSyn, and I'll provide a link to it in the description. I start the prep out by first adding the paraformaldehyde. I'm adding it to a three-necked round bottom flask, where in the middle you can see I've already set up a reflux column. Some of the powder got stuck in the funnel, and I tried to liberate it by tapping it, but it didn't work too well. To loosen up the powder, it was much easier to just use something like a glass stir rod. With most of the paraformaldehyde in the flask, I then added the ammonium chloride. With all of the ammonium chloride added, I then use a metal spatula to try to mix the powders together. It's pretty clear that this isn't the best method, but I thought I did an okay job, so I proceeded with things anyway. The reaction worked out fine, but if I were to do this again, I'd definitely mix it a little better. A stir bar was added to the flask, and then I sealed the opening with a glass stopper. I used some plastic clips to keep the stoppers in place, and then using a lab jack, I positioned a heating mantle below the flask. Here's a shot of the entire apparatus, and it's not very complicated. Above the flask, all I have is a condenser column, which is being cooled with cold water. Okay, with everything set up, it's time to start heating things. The goal is to heat it to about 105 C, and because I'm using a heating mantle, I can't use a thermometer, and I need to use a temperature probe. As it's heated, it's supposed to melt and let off CO2 gas, but at this point, it's pretty much just let off water vapor. I did a really bad job mixing it in the beginning, so I figured that maybe if I tried mixing it here again, I could get the reaction to start. My extra mixing effort did apparently pay off, because not too long after, the reaction actually started. Once the reaction starts, I take away the heating mantle, because I don't want to overheat things. The reaction between the paraformaldehyde and the ammonium chloride is exothermic, and ideally, it will produce enough heat to keep the reaction going. Sometimes, it's possible for the reaction to generate too much heat and go out of control, so it needs to be cooled, or it can generate not enough heat, and we need to kickstart it again. Because the reactants weren't mixed very well in my case, I actually did have to do a kickstart. I let it stir without the heating mantle for a while, and it seemed like more stuff liquefied, but the reaction never really got going. I put back the heating mantle for about 30 seconds, and this was enough to get the reaction properly started. Most of the paraformaldehyde and ammonium chloride has dissolved, so it's a lot clearer here. There's also a lot of CO2 gas bubbling off, which indicates that the reaction has started. As the reaction continued, everything dissolved, and I was left with a nice clear solution. This is the overall reaction that's occurring. Paraformaldehyde and ammonium chloride are reacting together to form trimethylamine hydrochloride, water, and CO2 gas. The balancing of this equation is kind of interesting because paraformaldehyde is a polymer. It's made up of repeating CH2O subunits, 
but each polymer unit has a variable length. The length normally ranges between 8 and 100 repeats, so we represent the amount of subunits by the variable n. By doing this, the balancing of the equation is accurate for all polymer lengths. This is just being technical though, and for practical purposes, we can assume that the paraformaldehyde is being completely broken down into formaldehyde. It should also be noted that each paraformaldehyde polymer technically contains one water molecule, but I disregarded that here in the equation. I'm going to talk about the mechanism now, but I couldn't find any concrete sources. I'm going to base this mechanism on my previous video where I made plain methylamine, but keep in mind that a lot of this is speculation. Anyway, as I said, in a previous video I made methylamine by reacting aqueous formaldehyde with ammonium chloride. I pulled this from the other video and you can see the major steps that were involved. In the first step, the formaldehyde and the ammonium chloride condense together to form an emine and water. A redox reaction then occurs where the emine is reduced and the formaldehyde is oxidized to formic acid. In the presence of hot water, the formic acid then degrades to CO2 gas. For trimethylamine, the major difference is that we're using paraformaldehyde instead of aqueous formaldehyde. In the end though, the paraformaldehyde is just being broken down into formaldehyde, so the mechanism should be similar. But now I have to answer the question as to why we're getting trimethylamine here instead of just methylamine. The reason for this seems to come down mostly to reaction conditions. When the two reactions are compared, we can see that the conditions are quite different. For methylamine, I used an excess of ammonium chloride, a lot of water, and low carefully controlled heat. For the trimethylamine, I used an excess of paraformaldehyde, a minimal amount of water, and relatively uncontrolled high heat. For the methylamine, the excess ammonium chloride was important because it statistically reduces the likelihood of the di and tri product. The di and tri product form when the methylamine product goes on to further react with more formaldehyde. By including a large excess of ammonium chloride, the formaldehyde is just more likely to react with the ammonium chloride than it is with the methylamine. Also, by keeping the heat low and using water to decrease the formaldehyde concentration, the reaction is slower, more controlled, and favors the formation of just methylamine. On top of this, excess water also breaks down formic acid that's formed. By flipping conditions around here and having more formaldehyde, the likelihood of a formaldehyde finding a methylamine is much higher. When it does, it can react to form dimethylamine and then trimethylamine. Although we didn't add water to this reaction, there's still water present for the second step to work. I imagine that most of the water is produced in the first step of the reaction, but there's also water present as a part of the paraformaldehyde polymer and in the not completely dry ammonium chloride. With less water here, the amount of formic acid that gets degraded by it should in theory be lower. This would mean that more could participate in the reaction by reducing the emine intermediates. Along with heat, all of these factors together should promote the polymethylated product. Anyway, as I said before, keep in mind that this is mostly just speculation on my part. I'm mostly just extrapolating from the methylamine synthesis, but that one doesn't even have very much info on it either. I let it react for about an hour and a half, and when I came back there was no more bubbling. The heating mantle was placed back under the flask, and the solution was heated to about 160 C. As it heats up, it will start to bubble and release CO2. The goal now is to keep the temperature around 160 until no more bubbles come off. After about 30 minutes of heating, the bubbling stopped, so I turned off the heating and the stirring. I removed the water lines from the condenser, and we can see here that it's really dirty. This is mostly just paraformaldehyde, which has sublimated out of the flask. Anyway, the hot plate's removed, the solution's allowed to cool, and I set up another apparatus. This is what the second one looks like, and at first glance, it might look a little bit complicated. 
There's two things directly attached to the reaction flask. On the left is an addition funnel with sodium hydroxide solution in it, and in the middle we have a condenser. Further down from the condenser, I've attached a receiving flask, which mostly acts as a trap. Between the receiving flask and the condenser, I have the vacuum takeoff adapter with a hose attached to it. The hose is expertly attached with some electrical tape, and it leads to a gas bubbler that's filled with hydrochloric acid. As we progress through the next few minutes, you'll see why each part is important. Also, it should be noted that up until this point, there's absolutely no stench because we directly made trimethylamine hydrochloride. The trimethylamine hydrochloride is a salted version of trimethylamine, and it doesn't really have very much of a smell. But in this next step, we're going to be freebasing it. The trimethylamine has a very strong fish odor, and it will almost definitely leave its mark on the work area. Okay, so to get things started, I add a few drops of the sodium hydroxide solution. Almost immediately after adding the sodium hydroxide solution, we can see that gas is being passed through the bubbler. This is a good sign that we're producing trimethylamine gas, but it should be noted that the gas being pushed through the bubbler at this moment is just air. We first need to displace all of the air out of the apparatus before we actually start to pass trimethylamine gas. As the sodium hydroxide reacts with the trimethylamine hydrochloride, the solution will heat up. Some water vapor will start to come off as it heats up, and it'll make it to the condenser. The condenser cools it down and turns it back to a liquid, and it's collected in the receiving flask. The water isn't very clean, and it contains side products and contaminants, and this is why we use the receiving flask as an intermediate. If the trimethylamine gas was pumped directly through the hydrochloric acid without passing through a condenser and the intermediate receiving flask, it wouldn't be very pure. It's also recommended to include a drying agent in the receiving flask, something like sodium hydroxide, but I opted not to do this. Also, I've added a stopcock valve to the hosing, and later on you'll see why it's important. In terms of reactions, what we're doing here is actually pretty simple. In the reaction flask, we have an acid-base reaction, which produces our free-base trimethylamine and sodium chloride salt. The trimethylamine that escapes as a gas is then bubbled through the hydrochloric acid. The reaction in the bubbler is pretty much the opposite of what we just did, and we're recreating the trimethylamine hydrochloride. The white smoky stuff in the apparatus here is very finely dispersed trimethylamine hydrochloride. This occurs because some of the vapors from the hydrochloric acid makes it back into the apparatus. Also, some of the trimethylamine hydrochloride is escaping the bubbler, and this means it's not being absorbed into the water. To fix this problem, I just need to slow down the addition of the sodium hydroxide. Here's a close-up of the gas bubbler, and I just want to point out a few things. As the gas is passed through the hydrochloric acid, some of it does react and dissolve, but clearly some of it still makes it to the top. When it reaches the top, the gas is released to the upper portion of the bubbler, but you can see that it quickly reacts and falls back down. Above concentrated hydrochloric acid, there's a decent amount of hydrochloric acid gas, and when the trimethylamine is released into it, it reacts, forms finely dispersed trimethylamine hydrochloride, which falls back down and slowly dissolves into the water. The reaction between the trimethylamine and the hydrochloric acid is exothermic, so the solution slowly heats up. As the solution heats up, the solubility of the trimethylamine hydrochloride will increase, and so will the reaction rate between the gas and the hydrochloric acid. So initially, in the cold hydrochloric acid, I had to keep the addition relatively slow, or else I'd lose trimethylamine hydrochloride out of the bubbler. However, as the solution heats up, I can slowly increase the rate that I bubble it through. One thing that totally didn't occur to me when I did this was that the volume of the hydrochloric acid solution would increase. I ended up being really lucky and it didn't overflow, but it could have ended up being a big problem. As I approached the end, I was able to bubble the gas through extremely quickly. Eventually, the very last bit of sodium hydroxide solution was added, and now it's time to heat things a little. 
At this point, it's extremely important to realize that since no more sodium hydroxide is being added, the contents of the reaction flask will start to cool. The air in the apparatus will cool down and shrink in volume, and it can create a suck back effect. This can cause the contents of the bubbler to be sucked back through the hosing and into the receiving flask. To prevent this, I separated the bubbler from the rest of the apparatus by closing the blue stopcock you see on the right. Trimethylamine gas is miscible with water, but it can be separated by boiling it out. It's pretty common for trimethylamine solutions to be around 45% by weight, but that's in pure water. The solution here is saturated with sodium chloride, so the amount of trimethylamine that's dissolved is definitely much lower. Anyway, as I heat it up, it starts to bubble again, but I'm afraid that the bubbler will overflow. I close the stopcock, empty some of the solution into a beaker, and then I start things up again. A decent amount of trimethylamine does bubble out, but it doesn't last for very long. Once the bubbling totally stopped, I turned off the heating, closed the stopcock, and let everything cool down. Once it was cool, I took apart the apparatus, and I started by emptying the bubbler. The solution from earlier in the smaller beaker was then combined. It was covered with some plastic wrap to prevent dust from falling in, and then I dismantled the rest of the apparatus. There's still trimethylamine gas in the apparatus, so to start with the cleanup, I added hydrochloric acid to the addition funnel. I added a little bit more hydrochloric acid, and then I let it sit like this for about a day to try to react with as much trimethylamine gas as possible. The contents of the reaction flask was treated with a lot of hydrochloric acid, and all of the waste was transferred to its own waste container. To isolate the trimethylamine hydrochloride, I need to evaporate almost all of the water. This has to be done either outside or in a well-ventilated area because we're also evaporating off hydrochloric acid. The evaporation is nearly done when solid starts to form on the sides. I let it go for about 30 seconds more and then I take it off the hot plate. The liquid we have here is mostly trimethylamine hydrochloride with a little bit of water. This is an important point to make because although I don't know how hot the solution actually is, it's definitely well above 100 C. Handling it in the wrong way could easily lead to a pretty nasty burn. The solution is allowed to sit and cool, and crystals of trimethylamine hydrochloride will slowly start to form. I kind of messed up and got a horrible time lapse, but I hope you guys forgive me. When I filmed this, I was just learning about the time lapse function of the camera, so I was bound to make some mistakes. To be fair though, the crystallization occurred much faster than I thought it would, so using a time lapse here was actually just a bad idea. As it was still cooling and crystallizing, I used a glass stir rod to break it up. If I didn't do this, it's possible that I could be left with a solid chunk in the flask, which would be a pain to deal with. When it fully cooled down, I placed it in the fridge overnight to allow it to crystallize as much as possible. In the morning, I was left with this nice viscous goop, which I then moved on to filtering. I poured out as much as I could into the filter, and I scraped out the rest using a glass stir rod. I turned on the vacuum and started to pull out the water. The goal here is to pull out the majority of the water, but it's going to be nearly impossible to pull out all of it. Trimethylamine hydrochloride is extremely hygroscopic, which means it loves pulling water out of the air. It's able to pull quite a bit of water from the air that passes through, so it never really dries. Using a glass stir rod, I broke it up, and you can see that it's still quite damp. The product here was temporarily stored in a sealed container. Here's the liquid that passed through the filter, and there's actually still trimethylamine in it. To get it out, I did the exact same thing as before, I just heated it until crystals started to form. Once the solids started to collect on the side, I took the beaker off heat, let it cool down, and then filtered off the crystals. This provided a second crop of crystals, but these aren't technically as pure as the first crop.
In theory, I could do this a third time, but the yield would be low and the product wouldn't be very pure. To try to dry things, I combined all of the crystals and pulled a vacuum. I heated it over a boiling water bath, and it did seem to work, but after running it for an hour, it didn't seem like the most efficient method. I probably would have had to pull a vacuum for several hours, and I didn't really want to leave my pump running that long. Also, it might have worked better with an oil bath, because I could get a higher temperature, but I didn't try it. I then tried to make a ghetto desiccator by just sealing the flask with a bunch of anhydrous calcium chloride. I didn't have much faith in this though, so I went ahead and ordered a proper vacuum desiccator online. It took about two weeks for the vacuum desiccator to arrive, and this whole time the flask sat in this ghetto one. It did actually seem to dry things up a little bit, but it wasn't substantially better than it was before. Once I got the vacuum desiccator, I put a bunch of calcium chloride at the bottom and transferred the trimethylamine hydrochloride to a bowl. The lid was placed on top, a vacuum was pulled, and then I sealed off the vacuum desiccator. The hosing was removed, and I let it sit like this for a few days. A few days later, I repressurized it, removed the lid, and checked on the trimethylamine hydrochloride. It still wasn't perfectly dry, but it was a lot better than any of the other methods that I tried before. Also, one thing to point out is that I used calcium chloride as the drying agent when I really should have used concentrated sulfuric acid. I think sulfuric acid would have worked a lot better here, but unfortunately at the time when I filmed this, I had actually run out. Okay, now for something that I thought was pretty interesting. I pre-weighed the bowl, so immediately after taking it out of the desiccator, I weighed it again to get the mass of the trimethylamine hydrochloride. The initial shot of pouring it out was a little bit overexposed, so I decided to redo it. Once I got the shot, I transferred it to a pre-weighed airtight storage container, and I re-weighed the whole thing again. The initial mass that I weighed was 113 grams, but the second mass that I got was 120. In the one minute that it took to redo the shot and transfer it to the bottle, it apparently picked up about 7 grams of water. To be fair, this was filmed in the summer and it was probably a little bit humid out, but still, 7 grams in a minute is quite a lot. Based on the initial yield of 113 grams, the final percent yield was 89%. Just by coincidence, this is the exact same yield that was reported by the org sin prep I was following. I was following it at a 1 7th scale, but apparently the yield is pretty consistent. As I said earlier, I didn't really have a use for this trimethylamine, so if you guys have any good ideas, I'd love to hear them in the comments. Also, just as a warning, after doing this prep, my workplace stank for something like 3 weeks, so keep that in mind. I only have two other videos filmed, but I'll still set up a straw poll for you guys to vote what you want to see next. This will be the last video that I'm posting in 2016, so I hope you guys enjoy, and I'll see you in the new year. As usual, I'd like to thank everyone who's supporting me on Patreon. Anyone who supports me with $5 or more will get their name at the end of the video like you see here. If I made a mistake with your name or I forgot to include you here, please let me know by messaging me on Patreon. Also, if you haven't already, you can subscribe to keep up to date with every video that I post. I currently release one video a week, but I'm going to try to release more.